Okay, I want to prepare these videos and you'll note that they actually come from the textbook publisher for the um, book that's been written by Arlene Fink, so the Conducting Research Literature Reviews from the Internet to Paper. And it follows along the five chapters that she has in her book. So one of the things that I'll be doing as I go through these particular um, presentations is I'll be making connections between the PAN textbook and the Prizek Prize textbook. Um, so that way, regardless of which of the two books you've bought, you've essentially got the same information. So the first chapter, for those of you that have Fink or that are reading through Fink, basically is sort of an overview, and it really touches on pretty much all of the things that we're going to do in the course, and she does so in a kind of step-by-step -step process. So when I sort of refer to what's coming up in some of the chapters in the other textbooks, you'll note that there's actually a fair amount of information that you probably haven't covered to date that Fink introduces in that first chapter and we talked a little bit about in that first couple of classes but were things that we would revisit or things that we would go to in greater detail as we got to them. Um, so to dive right in, when we're looking at this, essentially um, the first thing we have to ask ourselves is what is a literature review and sort of why is it different than other pieces of literature. And we talked a little bit about this in class, but essentially a literature review is a, uh, a piece of writing. It could be part of a manuscript, often the second part of a manuscript, or quite often it can be something in and of itself. So there's uh, often people will write literature review articles and there are actually journals uh, such as the Review of Educational Research and the Review of Research and Education that are specifically devoted to publishing literature review articles. Uh, some of the things that you want to keep in mind about literature review articles or literature reviews in general, it actually refers to a method of seeking the literature. Um, so as the slide indicates here, you know, it's systematic, it's explicit, uh, someone else could essentially replicate your work or it's reproducible. Um, and as you're going through and working on it, it's not just a summary of the literature, it's actually a critique of what has been found in the literature. And the really the goal of a literature review is to essentially try to figure out what it is that we do know so that that can help guide new research, it could help guide the way in which we implement programs within an educational context, it could guide how educational policies are developed by the uh, State Board of Education or the Office of Higher Education or the various parts of the you know your State Department of Education that uh, governs both K-12 and higher ed and other aspects of education as well. So as you're thinking about each of these sort of points, there's a couple that I really want to, to hit on. Um, the first is that it is systematic and this is one of the things that we'll look at in class in a fair level of detail. Essentially how do you systematically go through searching various databases, uh, various online sources, even in some cases various print resources to make sure that your literature review is comprehensive so that it isn't necessarily complete. You don't need to include everything, but you should have all of the relevant things in there. And by doing it in a systematic way, essentially someone else could come and read how you went about the process and essentially replicate or reproduce what it is that you did. And if you're able to get to that stage, you know you've done a good job because if you can go through the process and describe the process in your writing and then outline here's what you found from the literature review and then 
two years from now somebody could go and essentially go through the same process and find the same things that you found maybe some new things because there might be new things that have been written in the past two years that indicates that you did a good job that indicates that you included all of that relevant literature that you needed on your particular topic so Here's an example, and it's an example that Fink pulls out from her textbook, uh, but looking at the issue of, you know, how the effects of sunscreen on skin cancer. And as you can see, they just sort of started off with a very broad topic. They started off with this notion of they were interested in the connection between sunscreen and skin cancer. So you can see how they sort of broke it down into the individual pieces here at least in, in this particular example you know so their objective they wanted to review the published literature to examine the strength and consistency of association between melanoma which is a type of skin cancer and sunscreen use they were looking specifically in the medline databases and they were looking for the years from 1966 to 2003 and as you can see this particular piece of research uh, was a piece that was produced by uh, an author named Dennis in 2003 so keeping up to date right up to 2003 was good um, in terms of the eligibility which means essentially how did an article get included into their literature review they were looking for specifically stu analytical studies so studies that actually um, you know went out and collected data in a reliable and valid way that actually included specific data that focused upon sunscreen use before the diagnosis of melanoma. In terms of how they ensured the reliability of their work, so they ensured that essentially everything that should have been found was found, uh, what they did was they actually had two reviewers that re that went through searching these databases. So in theory, if reviewer A found something and reviewer B found something, they started to question themselves, and that's that idea of inconsistencies. Uh, so they would look at these particular articles that only one of the two reviewers found to see if if it was appropriate for their particular literature review and if they couldn't agree they actually had a third person come in to review that piece of literature to decide whether or not it met their eligibility criteria and essentially once they had agreement either because they had you know agreement amongst the two reviewers or because the third party decided it for them that's how they included all of their literature so that's a very you can see systematic process here and I would submit to you that it's probably a, a fairly reliable process and based upon the way in which they've described it here you could probably sit down with a colleague and be able to replicate or reproduce this particular process Here's another example, uh, homework and achievement, a little bit closer to home in terms of, of education. This one was published by an author by the name of Cooper back in 2006. Uh, essentially, here's how they sort of structured it. Uh, their methods, they were looking through the published literature since 2000. As they described it in their actual literature review, they essentially tried to group the studies into one of four research designs um, and they were one of the things that the, uh, I guess they were looking for um, was whether or not the research had design flaws so was it good research or bad research and um, when you get to the journal article reviews you'll see that just because a study is published doesn't necessarily mean that at least based upon what they have described in the published article that you believe that they've done a good job um, this particular case you can see there were two findings uh, one of the things was that they did find that there was consistent evidence or consistent data or essentially most of the literature said that homework had a positive influence on achievement but 
Um, the other thing that they found was that they there wasn't that much evidence between the connection between homework and achievement and how that essentially affected student performance on standardized testing. Um, so one of the types of achievement that essentially it that finding didn't hold true for uh, was that that notion of standardized testing. So um, think in this published um, PowerPoint that she provides or that the publisher provides I should say has another example here but I think we've got a sense from these two as to sort of you know how folks structure and as you can see from the two of them um, you know this one in terms of describing in the actual literature review how they went about it is much less than say what this one was this one provided a very detailed way of how they went about it so, to the point that even as someone who knows nothing about you know oncology and, and melanoma but just as a general researcher I think I could replicate this whereas based upon the level of data that I've got here the level of description of how they went about it I'm not sure I could redo this one myself um, I'm not sure it would meet the characteristics of you know, what we would call that sort of systematic process, at least not in how they've described the process. And one of the things that you'll find as you start reviewing pieces of literature is the level of detail that folks provide varies significantly in terms of the, how they went about doing things, both in terms of how they went about doing their literature review, but also in terms of how they went about conducting their study. So, why would you do a literature review in the first place? Well, for the purposes of this course, we're actually doing it because we're moving um, really for that first one. We're, we're looking to essentially produce a proposal that uh, would then lead to a, a thesis or dissertation. People will also do it, and you'll note this in all pretty much most of the articles that you're reviewing, or the items that you're reviewing. People do it as setting a stage for research projects. Um, as the as the Fink slide here, the, it also focuses upon um, grants as well. as another way of looking at it. In terms of, I guess, a less practical purpose, um, you know, one of the things that literature reviews will do is they'll tell you sort of what we know about a current topic right now um, that could help you identify you know, effective, in some cases ineffective, ways of going about implementing various uh, things that you're trying to do and you know, various pedagogical strategies or programs or methods of instructional design or types of evaluation you know, in your classrooms or in your specific work context. Um, the other couple of things, I guess, that Think talks about, you know, for some topics, literature reviews are actually quite useful just to you know satisfy your own curiosity, uh, your own intellectual um, curiosity about something. Uh, typically speaking as well, literature reviews will let you know sort of who the big names are in the field, who are those seminal people, because not only will they show up in your literature review, but one of the things you'll note is that they consistently show up in everybody else's literature review. So it allows you to sort of get a lay of the land in terms of your particular field, at least from an academic or published research sense. Now, what we've seen here in the first five or six slides is fairly, while well, again it's coming from Fink, is fairly consistent with the types of things that you would find in the first chapter of the PAN textbook. Um, so those first six or seven pages in the PAN textbook um, sort of give you an overview of these kinds of, of uh, this kind of information if you will. So transitioning a little bit let's uh, start looking at you know how you go about conducting literature reviews and this is a very broad overview and in all honesty we'll spend uh, some time in each of the subsequent classes sort of diving into each of these steps in, in a more specific way and you'll note that as I sort of reference them in, in the Penn and Prizek textbooks, textbooks right now um, you'll find that 
each of these topics tend to be covered in much greater detail, often later in the course. Um, so starting with the first one, um, you know, once you get sort of that general uh, idea and during class we work on a little bit of this in terms of trying to take a broad idea or a couple of ideas and, and distill it down to something very specific. And not just distilling your topic down to something very specific, but then trying to figure out, okay, what are the key terms that you're going to need to include or in some cases exclude when it comes to actually searching the literature. So this sort of three-step process that she's got here, three-part process in step one, you know, where you have that sort of general idea and then you can, you know, get it down much more specifically and then actually have specific terms that are used is going to be important. You know, so for my own case, for example, uh, I'm interested in K-12 online learning or K-12 distance learning. And, you know, that's a very general topic. In my case, you know, when I look at it more specifically, well, my own research interests focus specifically upon how do we design, deliver, and support online learning for K-12 students, in particular students that are in rural jurisdictions, because I'm very interested in rural education. So you can see how I've gone from just sort of that general topic or subfield of K-12 online learning or K-12 distance learning to a very specific thing I'm interested in. And even that specific thing is still kind of broad. Um, you know, how do we design, deliver, and support online learning for K-12 students effectively in rural environments or rural contexts. So there are a couple of key terms there that you know, you would pull out. Obviously, rural education or rural schooling would be one of those key terms. Um, you know, K-12 online learning would be one, or K-12 distance learning. You could call it K-12 distance education. One of the things that you'll do when you start searching the databases is click on the keywords that are used to describe the article, descriptors they're often called in a database, and see what other terms they're using. So in my own field, K-12 online learning often gets called virtual schooling or cyber schooling. And in some cases, cyber schooling is one word, sometimes it's two words. Um, cyber education is another term that's often used. So when I click on those keywords on articles that I'm finding, or in the databases when I click on the descriptors, I'll see some of these other keywords that will help me figure out, you know, what types of things I should be searching for. So step two is then figuring, okay, well, where do you search? Um, in the case of, of Sacred Heart, we actually have a, a fairly robust online subscription to uh, you know a number of databases in education that I think will be quite useful when you go into the library website and if you go under education guides under their their study guides their their lib guides you'll see a list of the ones that are more specific to education they're not exclusive for example JSTOR is a one that's not listed there I think it's listed under the arts or English or something like that that one often has education articles, but it's not primarily an education database. Uh, the ones that are primarily education databases, like Eric and Ed Lib IT, um, or Ed IT Lib, those ones tend to be up in that um, education category. Another one that I might suggest is the uh, ProQuest dissertation and thesis database. I think actually in the Sacred Heart system, it's listed as dissertation and thesis database and then ProQuest in parentheses so if you're looking for it in the subject areas uh, you would look under the D's as opposed to the P's um, but um, you know depending upon your topic you sort of have to make decisions about where you want to search so for example when I first began researching my topic K-12 online learning um, it was about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, and there wasn't a lot written at that time. So in those cases, university databases weren't necessarily the, the best places to be looking. Um, oftentimes, I just found myself searching on the web in general and Google because a lot of the literature that was being published were being published by um, folks that were doing evaluations of you know these programs. So in many cases, they might have been policy centers or research institutes, or in some cases just private uh, 
uh, contractors that were contracted out to evaluate these programs. So these ones were generally showing up on just, you know, on a regular Google search. There were a lot of reports being written by various um, think tanks and ideological groups and teachers unions and various levels of government. None of those things or very few of those things would show up in databases that the library would subscribe to and many of them wouldn't even show up in Google Scholar. I just had to do a general Google search. So basically depending upon what it is that you're looking for, um, you want to select where you're searching. Now, I forgot to mention as we're going through this, um, step one is really well described in that um, chapter two of PAN, so that's selecting the topic for research. So when you're actually sort of thinking about how to go through these steps, that's one of the things that you want to you know, consider um, you know, looking through chapter two of PAN. Similarly, chap uh, this step two here, really covers off a lot of the things that we're seeing in chapter three of PAN. So if PAN is the textbook that you've bought and you're sort of following along here, um, you know, say PAN and PryCheck were the two ones that you bought, then step one is really described in chapter two. Step two is really described here in chapter three. Looking at step three, this actually will continue. And in PAN, he actually talks about this both in chapter two and chapter three because he sort of combines it but this idea of you know okay now that we've got our topic now that we've got our keywords how do we actually search and how do we go about looking for that information um, one of the things that you want to get used to is this notion of boolean logic which essentially is how computers t how search engines talk to each other and there's not a lot of things that you want to really keep in mind when you're doing this uh, for our purposes, there are really a couple of pieces of Boolean logic that we would want to remember. And the example that, that Fink uses here, I think, is a bad example. Um, the one that I use probably the most is if I want two words to f be found together, so in my case, for example, like online learning. If I just wrote online learning, when it searches, it's looking for the word online and it's looking for the word learning, not necessarily together. So online might be in the first paragraph, learning might be in the last paragraph, and that's going to show up in my search. If I want to find both words together, I'll put a um, quotation marks around them. So if I had, you know, quotation mark, online learning, quotation mark, it'll search for the, the phrase online learning together. So I use that particular bit of Boolean logic a great deal. The other one that I use a, a fair amount is um, if you have a, a dash or a minus sign and then a word right after it with no space in between it, that means it will exclude a word. So for example, if I wanted to search for online learning, I also want to find the word K-12 somewhere in there, and I want to minus... Um, university because I don't want to find university students so what I would do is I would have online learning in quotation marks then I would just have the word k-12 there and then I'd have minus university with no space in between and that would essentially give me um, a search that would search for the phrase online learning together it would also look for the words k-12 somewhere in the article and if it found the word university in the article, that article wouldn't show up in my search. So there are ways in which we can do that. And when, as we're looking through, um, we want to sort of essentially look at things like the title, things like the abstract, and use that as a guide to figure out if this is something that is going to be useful to us. One of the things that you'll note is that depending upon how broad your topic is and for that matter how robust or how long your topic has been around, you may find that there is a lot of, you know, your search generates thousands of hits and you're wondering to yourself, how am I going to go through thousands of things? So there's some other things that you want to include in your screening. Um, one of the things I would is I would actually check off in the, the databases that you only want English-only languages or English-only articles, um, you know, 
that will decrease the number, although probably not all that much. Now, if you're doing a topic that focuses upon other countries where other languages are spoken, or for that matter, if you're fluent in another language yourself, that might not necessarily be something you'd want to do. Limiting publication dates. So um, in my case, for example, technology changes a great deal. Very quickly, actually. So things that we knew about K-12 online learning back in the 90s, even the early 2000s, might not necessarily be applicable now 10, 15, 20 years later. So I might, for example, limit my search to try to cut down on the number to just say 2005 to 2015. Are there particular populations that you're interested in? So, for example, in the example I gave before, I'm... In terms of my topic, I'm interested in rural education, but when I was looking at, you know, the example of my keywords, online learning in quotation or in uh, quotation marks, K-12 minus university, I didn't put rural in there. You know, if I added in rural in there, that would pull out a specific population that I'm interested in, and it might narrow down the number of, of hits that I get. Similarly with, you know, specific problems or specific authors. If you know your topic well enough to know, you know, who people should be citing. Uh, one of the big names in my field is Kathy Kavanaugh. Um, so, you know, in my mind, if you've done a good piece of research, if you've done a reasonable literature review as a part of that research, you would have found Kathy Kavanaugh's name. So I could actually have that as one of my search terms because I know that anyone who didn't include her in their literature review when they're you know going through and talking about their research, in my mind, didn't do a good job in the first place because Kathy is one of the seminal people in my field. So that might be something that I use to screen out more folks. So once you've got your, your, your information... How do you figure out what's good? How do you figure out what to use? And this starts getting into essentially um, chapter five of PAN and really where the whole Prizac textbook starts to come in. Um, you know, particularly when you start to, to look at, um, well, really from chapter two, pretty much right through to chapter 12, with the exception of, of one chapter, he begins each of his chapters with evaluating. Um, in terms of the titles. So one of the things that you'll have to do as you go through and look at each of these is you'll have to essentially evaluate the quality of the articles. And one of the ways in which of doing that is looking at the, essentially the methodological claims. Um, you know, is the research design good? Um, you know, do they do things to ensure the validity and reliability of their research? Um, the type of qualitative and quantitative methods that they're using, do they seem appropriate to you? Um, based upon the actual data that they present in the article, does that justify or does that support the results that they're finding? And do those results essentially back up or support the conclusions that they're making? You know, these are judgment calls that you'll have to make that, um, you know, those are things that take time. Those are things that, uh, you know, we will get better at as we read more of these things. So when you first start doing this, like when you do the journal article um, review assignment, it may be frustrating because you may not really have a strong sense of whether or not um, this particular regression analysis or this particular case study um, is, you know, a good piece of research. You know, that's something that you'll learn over time. So I wouldn't worry too much if at this stage that you're not as, as attuned to some of these things. And as we get into the course and start reading some of the additional material about evaluating these things and uh, some of the supplemental resources that you'll find in Blackboard, you'll get a little bit more. When we get into the introductory to research course, it'll make even more sense to you. So a lot of this will come with practice. Now, in terms of actually, oops, in terms of actually, you know, once you've got all of the articles together, doing the actual review, um, you know, so you're going to start looking at all of the articles that you find. And you're essentially going to start looking for, okay, what kinds of things are they telling me 
after you, I guess you've looked at and said, okay, these are ones that really I don't want to use because for whatever reason, they might not be methodologically sound. They might not really hit your topic perfectly. And while the search picked them up and the abstract looked okay, when you actually read the article, yeah, no, this really isn't what I'm looking for. You know, so once you've weeded out those for various reasons, then you want to look at <clears throat> what do you have that is, is useful. And trying to figure out, okay, what what can I learn from these? Um, you know, and in order to do that, you really have to get down to the core sense of the articles that you've got. Um, and it's okay if if you end up with fewer studies than than what you had initially anticipated. Even of all of the ones that you've got, you know, there are some that are going to be useful or relevant to you, and some that really just you know aren't worthy of of wasting your time on. So. The final step that uh, Fink talks about uh, is essentially going through and figuring, okay, what does all of this say? And if you're looking at uh, the PAN textbook, this is where we start getting into chapter 6 and chapter 7, and to a lesser extent, those three or four writing uh, the first draft chapters, although this is probably a little bit before the, the writing stage. Um, when you're looking at the project chapter, this is where you start getting into um, that notion of kind of putting it all together. So we've sort of, we've gone through and we've done uh, essentially the first 12 chapters in this now at this stage of the process, not necessarily the stage of the course, but once you get to the stage of, of your literature review. Um, so now you're trying to put it all together. So essentially, you know, how do you organize this? Um, a table format is often useful to sort of help you see the big picture because you're looking for trends. You know, you're looking for, you know, what does this tell you? Do you have six studies that say X and five studies that say Y and then a, another three studies that say Z? Um, you know, do these nine studies that you have here all find the same three things in their findings, even if some of them have five different findings, some of them have four, some of them six, but there are three things that they all agree upon. Um, maybe it's it's looking at the context. So when the study is done in rural areas, they always find this, whereas when it's done out in the suburbs, they always find this. Or when it's done with younger students, they come up with these kinds of things. Or when it's done with older students, they come up with these kinds of things. So looking at you know the various details of the studies, from you know the uh, how they did the intervention to the type of participants, to the type of setting, to what they actually found. You know what kinds of trends can we see in this? And that's really what your literature review is. It's not just saying that. You know, one person says this, then one person says this, and even saying one person says this and it was good research, and one another person says this and it was bad research. Um, you know, it's this group of researchers found this thing happening, and they all kind of agreed upon it, even if they described it in slightly different ways. And you know, but this group of researchers over here disagreed. They found it, and you know, they it was kind of different in how they went about doing it. So. Beyond just, you know, looking at sort of the systematic databases and stuff like that, um, even Google Scholar, um, what are some of the other things that you want to keep in mind so you can ensure that you found everything? Um, the first thing that I always do, particularly once I get down to that list, when I get down to that, you know, where that step seven where I'm creating that table, um, I start looking through the references of those in those articles to see if there's anything in there that looks relevant that I might have missed. Um, in all honesty, if I see names that come up again and again and again and again and again, I mean, it's not that difficult to Google them and see if they're still alive, depending upon you know your topic. If you're doing something that you know has a bit of a history. Some of those folks might not be with us anymore, but if they're still around and you can find an email address for them, shoot them an email and say, you know, like, are there any seminal works in the field that, um, you know, here's the list that I found, um, or here are the authors that I found, you know, is there anyone that really has escaped me at this point, um, you know? The other thing that I'll mention is once you start getting outside of the academic databases, there are a couple of things that you want to keep in mind. A lot of, particularly when it comes to reports, um, a lot of reports, you know, even, regardless if it's written by the government or by some nonpartisan organization, 
Many reports are written with a particular agenda, often with a particular ideology in mind. And just because somebody has a PhD and you know is writing from a nonpartisan uh, policy tank, um, policy think tank or research center, doesn't necessarily mean that what they're saying is accurate. Um, I could provide literally hundreds of examples of these, and uh, not to single out any one organization, I, I, I won't. Um, but, you know, these are things that you want to be wary of as, as you're looking at them and start to question um, the validity of what they're saying and how they're describing things and the terms that they're using. So that's, I guess, a, a brief summary of, of Chapter 1 of Fink, although, as you can see, the nature and way which she writes it up, it covers off several of the topics in the first really six or seven chapters in, in the PAN textbook and most of the, you know, touches on most of the chapters in the Prizek textbook. Um, so as we go through, you'll see that uh, Fink probably does this in a more overview, sort of generalized way, whereas the other two books that we have for the course do it in a much more... Uh, they zero in on the topic in a much more specific way. So you will find that um, depending on which of the two you bought, you might get sort of that, that macro high-level view or you may get that sort of nuts and bolts in your face kind of view.